what is a service mesh? Why do we want it? What it's good for? Should we use it in the first place? To understand why we need service mesh, we might want to go back in history. In the past, most of us had a small number of applications, or at least compared to the number of applications we have today, what we had 10 or 20 years ago was relatively small. It was almost insignificant with the scope we are dealing with today. Today, it is not uncommon to have tens or hundreds or thousands of applications and multiple replicas of those applications floating around nodes spread around a single cluster or multiple clusters. And sometimes those clusters are spread across multiple regions. They're spread across the globe. The tendency to increase the number of applications and number of instances of applications and number of replicas existed for a long time. But recently, and by recently, I mean last five years or 10 years, that tendency increased with the emergence of containers which enabled microservices. We are multiplying everything we have by five, 10 or factor of 100 or even 1000. Anyways, long, long time ago, we might have a single front end, a single back end that speaks with a single database. That's not the case anymore. Almost nobody has that anymore. And at that time, those few components or few applications were living in real servers. I mean, they're still living in real servers, but servers at that time had fixed IPs. And an application always knew how to find the database because database is on this IP and the front end is on that IP and this is where the back end is. Every once in a while, those servers would fail, but changing the IPs, changing the addresses of the applications we speak with was relatively straightforward because there wasn't much to do. Today, that is unacceptable for many reasons. First of all, we have many more applications, many more instances and replicas and what's or not. And finding them is already more challenging simply because there are more of those. On top of that, everything is dynamic. They're changing their locations because we're doing rolling updates or canary releases and what's or not. And then the application is suddenly moved from here to there. And then the node fails and it is automatically replaced with a new node and so on and so forth. And the problem is that all that is dynamic and the only solution to find applications is to be equally dynamic. So we cannot hard code IPs or hard code addresses. We need to have a system that finds out where everything is. And it needs to make it transparent in a way that the application can just say, hey, I want to communicate with application X. I do not know where it is. I do not care where it is. It's your problem, whomever you are, to find out where that application is and to load balance across all the replicas of that application and to do mutual TLS and to do this and to do that. There are many things that need to be done today or that should be done today. And many, if not all of those needs, at least those related with networking could be solved with Service Mesh. But before we jump into Service Mesh, let's talk about service discovery, which is obviously the first and the biggest problem we have or we had in the past. Service discovery is all about figuring out where things are. And Kubernetes solved that problem with services. We are attaching a service for every single application and that service has a unique name, at least within the namespace. And then any application can communicate with any other application just by knowing the name of the service. And then Kubernetes itself or services inside Kubernetes are figuring out how to route requests from one place to another just based on the name. They're keeping always up to date list of IPs in IP tables and doing all the magic that needs to be done. Long story short, as long as we are using services and everybody in Kubernetes is using services, discovery of different applications is extremely easy. Actually, there is nothing to be done. All we need to know is the name of the service attached to an application, and then we can communicate with that application just by knowing the name. And it is Kubernetes job to figure out how to route those requests and do whatever needs to be done. However, and this is a big one, finding applications is not enough. It was a big deal in the past. Now that's solved. Now we have other issues. And the solution to those issues is, or could be, let's say, service mesh. We need observability, security, reliability, and other illities, right? We need a lot of illities. Think of it that way. So what is a service mesh? A simplified description would be that service mesh is a way to control the flow of data. It is a way to control how applications share data between themselves. 
It is an infrastructure built into applications. And this is a huge shift compared to what we had in the past, long time ago. It is software-defined infrastructure related to networking. Majority of service meshes are based on the same principle, and that principle is to distribute a set of proxies. And those proxies are usually embedded into pods as sidecars. Sidecars are additional containers that do not host our application, but perform additional functions serving certain purposes required by those applications, but not put into the code of those applications. That description, the one I just mentioned, probably does not explain much. So let's jump into how Service Mesh works and then a few examples. And that will probably clarify what it is and how it really works and what it does and what's not. How does Service Mesh work? Imagine an application that makes a request to another application. When such a request is created, Service Mesh applies dynamic routing. And it tries to determine the destination of that request. So an application sends a request to some, let's say, imaginary unique ID and Service Mesh tries to figure out, hey, this imaginary name corresponds with this application, with those replicas. I should forward that request to that specific place, that specific replica because of this and that. And this and that can be many things like, hey, should that request be forwarded somewhere inside of the local cluster where the request originated, or maybe to a remote cluster? Should it go to the current version of the application, or maybe to a canary release of application, because again, there are certain criteria that make me believe that, hey, this request maybe is intended to be a canary release. Which one of those many replicas of the application should actually receive the request? Which one might respond the fastest? and so on and so forth. So Service Mesh uses a bunch of different criteria to figure out what is the exact place a request should be sent to and why that is better than any other place where it might go. And even once it chooses the destination, it might change its mind. It might choose this destination, but then it might figure out that that destination is too slow and redirecting again that request somewhere else might result in a faster response. And while doing all that routing, Service Mesh captures all the metrics and all the traces and stores all that somewhere for multiple reasons. To begin with, so that it can make better decisions in the future and also to provide observability to us, to humans, so that we can observe, so that we can see what is happening in the system, what are the bottlenecks and so on and so forth, so that we can improve our system. And on top of all that, all those requests floating around are automatically encrypted. They all get mutual TLS or MTLS so that all the communication within a service mesh is encrypted. And all that is happening without our intervention. There is nothing to put in the code of our application. There is no special application-specific configuration and so on and so forth. Now, service mesh is typically split into two parts, or at least most of service meshes. I'm trying to generalize it, and there might always be an exception or two. Anyways, service mesh usually has a control plane and a data plane. Data plane is doing the real work. It is translating, forwarding, and observing every single data packet. It is responsible for health check routing, for load balancing, authentication and authorization, observability, and so on and so forth. Data plane is where the action is happening. Control plane, on the other hand, is more like a supervisor. It's almost like a manager of a team. It allows us, humans, to apply policies and configurations that will be propagated to the data plane or multiple data planes. So we interact with the control plane, control plane supervises the data plane, and data plane is doing all the magic. And all that is happening in a very decoupled way. There is no need to change a single line of code of your applications. So let's talk about some of the features of Service Mesh, or at least those most commonly used features. We can group them into three categories. Connect, Secure, and Monitor. Those are the primary functions of a Service Mesh. Connect, Secure, Monitor. Among the features, or at least commonly used features, there is Mutual TLS. 
What that means is that all the communication between all the endpoints is automatically encrypted. Then there is latency aware load balancing. Kubernetes service, you know, the one available in Kubernetes out of the box, is doing round robin load balancing. That means that it is more or less equally distributing requests across all the replicas of an application. Latency aware load balancing, the one available in service mesh, allows us to forward requests to a specific replica, the one that is most likely to respond faster than others. So it is not blindly distributing requests, but distributing them in a way that is most likely going to provide the fastest answer or the fastest response. Then we have retries. If something happens with the request, it does not have to be lost. The system, Service Mesh, can retry requests a certain number of times, whatever we configure it to do, so that a failed request is retried, repeated, until we get the response or until it times out or the number of requests is exhausted. Then we have traffic shifting or routing, which is extremely important for canary releases or blue-green deployments. Traffic shifting allows us to send a certain percentage or certain number of requests to specific release or specific group of pods while all the other requests are going somewhere else. So it allows us to say, hey, only people in, let's say, United States should see this new release while the rest of the world should go there. Or 27% of people should go there and all the rest should go to some other place and so on and so forth. Then we have circuit breaking. It allows our application to deal with overloads, with the DDoS attacks and so on and so forth. It allows our system to know when it should limit the number of requests going to certain place, depending on the amount of workload or what is going on and so on and so forth. Further on, we get observability. Through the data collected by Service Mesh, we can know exactly what is going on, both on a level of individual requests all the way to aggregated data that can show us tendencies and so on and so forth. We can trace a request coming into our cluster, going to one place and then to another and so on and so forth. We can identify what failed, why it failed, why it stopped and so on and so forth. Those are some of the commonly used features, let's say. There are many others that Service Mesh provides. They're all focused one way or another on networking. And networking is typically more important than majority of people think it is. And we are still faced with a problem which Service Mesh tool we will use. I will not go through that specific question in this video. If you want me, I can compare Service Mesh tools. Just let me know in the comments. 